thank you for that lovely introduction and generous introduction. It's a great pleasure to be in Heidelberg and an honor to be in Heidelberg, especially um, at the invitation of the Center for Apocalyptic and Post-Apocalyptic Studies. I think that most people in the world recognize that um, we're facing many threats, but in particular two uh, existential crises, global warming and the nuclear peril. And um, I think that the, in the year and a half that um, the Center for Apocalyptic and Post-Apocalyptic Studies has existed, it's begun really to alert universities around the world to the fact that we have a civic and philosophic responsibility to find or even invent the tools to dismantle these two perils as well as um, other perils. And uh, the center, I think, has, has done that uh, merely by existing and having a name that states forthrightly what its mission is. It's done it as well by acting as a very uh, specific lens on the topic. And maybe most importantly, it's done it by bringing together wonderful scholars who instead of having to row the boat alone in the middle of the ocean with no one else listening, have one another to um, reinforce and strengthen their undertakings. Um, and I'm, I should say that I'm particularly uh, grateful to Robert uh, Folger and Thomas Meyer and Felicitas Lust, um, as well as all the people at the center who have helped me uh, get here and uh, be standing here and, and talking to you tonight. So one thing about the uh, nuclear peril is that the nuclear architecture is so vast that it's hard to grasp it. And um, one way that one can begin to grasp it is to look at this image from, that's designed by um, the Nagasaki Research Council, but is also based on figures from the American Federation of Scientists which is known to be the um, most accurate uh, source of information on, on the issue of um, nuclear weapons. Do people, do the lights need to be dimmed a bit so people can see it or can you see it? Fine, it's fine, okay. Um, and there's a great deal that can be said about uh, this, this image, but uh, let me just say a couple of things. Uh, I could clearly spend the whole evening describing it. But the first thing you should realize is that uh, each icon represents five warheads. Um, if you were then to multiply the icons, you could see that even once you double it, it doesn't fit on the uh, poster. Once you have five times what's there, you're getting even beyond this whole screen. Uh, of which the, the, my image is just a small part. The second thing uh, to know is the colors have a meaning. The blue are submarine launched uh, missiles. So for example, China uh, that's up at about two o'clock. Uh, until a few years ago, there were no blue icons for China, but China has been very much developing its submarine launched um, missiles. The um, red icons represent the ICBMs, the ground-based or ground-launched missiles. The green represent air-delivered missiles. This is part that where uh, Germany's contribution to, uh, to planning for the delivery of some of the warheads comes in. Uh, the gray are uh, warheads that have nominally uh, been retired but have not been dismantled so that uh, they remain live and on call should um, any country need them. And um, the, the main thing to know about this image is that 90% of these warheads are owned by either the United States or Russia. So everything from two o'clock down to seven o'clock is owned by the United States. Then from about seven or eight o'clock over to one o'clock or two o'clock, that's owned by Russia. And then the small wedge up at two o'clock are the other seven nuclear states. Um, their arsenals are not minimal. Uh, North Korea's is, of course, the smallest. They have fewer than 40 warheads, but that can easily kill two billion people. Um, so it's not something negligible by any means. However, we have to understand what other countries, nuclear and non-nuclear, are looking at 
when they look at the United States and, uh, and, and Russia. Um, the one other thing to say uh, about this is that you'll see at the center of the image the um, Bulletin of Atomic Scientists Doomsday Clock, often said to be the most important piece of design uh, technology in the 20th century. Maybe one of you will invent the most important design for the 21st century. Um, it was invented in 1947. It gives every year the window of time to indicate the scale of the peril. It's now set at 100 seconds to midnight, which is the closest it's ever been. Um, and one might think that, uh, that this is perhaps um, you know, alarmist uh, for people who attend all the time to the nuclear peril, but even hardcore uh, members of the US Defense Department have said over and over again, the peril in the 21st century is greater than it was in the 20th century. William Perry, for example, who was Secretary of Defense under Clinton, President Clinton, has said that, and in fact, he's devoting the end of his life to trying to wake up American citizens um, who, to, for whom this is, is simply rarely um, an issue. Henry Kissinger, again, not a soft-minded person, has repeatedly called for a global zero. And even before President Putin invaded Yugoslavia, he um, was on record as saying over and over again, most recently in July of 2021 in the Guardian newspaper, more danger now than in the 20th century because of advances, for example, in AI that make the, all the tripwires um, more and more dangerous. So too, Robert McNamara, who served under President Kennedy before he died, um, repeatedly raged about how illegal, immoral, dangerous, and wholly um, unneeded these weapons were, um, and, and, uh, and so forth. I should add one more, and that is General Lee Butler, who was the head of our nuclear triad, that is the overall head of our Nuclear Strategic Command um, in the early 90s, um, felt that after the Berlin Wall opened, the nuclear arsenals everywhere should be dismantled. And he, too, uh, devoted many years at the end part uh, in the late stages of his life, he's still alive, to trying to wake up um, our fellow citizens who, who are not alert to this um, at all. Now, the scale of the warheads is, as you might know, smaller now than it was in the 1980s, the, um, the time that Robert referred to, much smaller. At its height, it was 64,000, now it's 12,000. Should we relax about that? Well, it's hard, again, to get one's mind, to wrap one's mind around what is the scale. But I think that though the New York Times is not often helpful, in my, in my view, on the issue of nuclear weapons, they actually did find a good way of representing this. And here's, here's what they said. They said, how many of these of our, our warheads, the US warheads, uh, would be needed um, if we wanted to decimate, that was their word, decimate the populations of seven countries. And the seven countries they took were Libya, Syria, Iraq, Iran, North Korea, Russia, and China. And then they said, how many of the warheads after we've done that would still remain in the United States arsenal? And the answer was these, and these, and these, and these and also these. And as they concluded, more than 70% of the stockpile would um, remain. So returning to the goal of trying to grasp the nuclear architecture, to me, a different way of trying to um, articulate it is to just take a, a single weapon, um, any weapon, uh, such as a knife or a gun, and remember that structurally it has two ends, an end where the infliction of the injury is done and an end at which the injury is received. And despite the shift in scale, that's obviously also true of the nuclear arsenal. Um, but at each of those ends, there's something extraordinary going on. At the injuring end, nuclear weapons are extraordinary, or we could say outrageous, or we could say obscene, because of the scale of the people, the number of people 
who will be injured. And that's long been registered in words like weapons of mass destruction and so forth. But they have an equally remarkable feature at the other end, which is that this whole uh, weapon uh, or series of weapons is launched by a single individual. And that is true in the United States. It's been true throughout the nuclear age. It's true in Russia. Uh, it's true in North Korea. In Pakistan, it takes three people. But it doesn't matter whether it's one or 12. It, it happens in the United States to be absolutely one. That means people in the Pentagon and all the way along the, the chain train day and night, day after day, for carrying out the launch order when it comes. And the launch order, as former, former missile launch officer Bruce Blair um, reported, uh, is half the length of a tweet. Um, so it's a, 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 a kind of staggering situation. And as obscene as the level of injury is, the fact that this is being done by one person, that there are 8 billion people on Earth, and a total of nine of them, or I don't care whether you multiply it by three, but a tiny number have the power to decide to eliminate the planet is uh, you know, just astonishing. The um, United States population is um, singularly unaware of the danger, except at uh, specific moments, and, and you can, I'm sure you know what they are. One was a few years ago when President Trump, um, uh, as well as, um, as the leader of North Korea, Kim Jong-un, were making nuclear threats to one another. Um, or right now, when President Putin is making threats, and there have been counter threats back, as when, um, when somebody uh, from the uh, French government reminded Putin that NATO has its own nuclear um, weapons. So there's been threats and counter threats. And this kind of language goes on while the rest of the population of the globe, 8 billion people, trade guesses about whether, what the level of seriousness is. Is, does Putin mean it? No, yes. Is he bluffing? No, yes. Could it happen even if he's just uh, bluffing? No, yes. Um, could he be mad? No, yes. And all of us have to do that. That's all we can do, it seems. Um, and yet, you have to appreciate the infantilization of the world's population that they have left, allowed a handful of men to determine whether the globe will blow up um, with uh, no input from any of the citizens of Earth um, other than to sit there helplessly in front of their televisions or iPhones wondering uh, what will really happen. And some guesses sound more authoritative than others, but none of them are very authoritative. Now, while it's possible Putin will do this, and you know, I said at the beginning, global warming, nuclear peril are twin harms, but Nuclear peril um, is, as, as uh, a diplomat in the United States said, global warming at supersonic speed. Uh, we know that global warming can happen, you know, disable the whole humanity and its civilization over the next uh, 80 years. And uh, nuclear weapons might do that tonight in the next 80, 80 minutes. While we talk about the possibility of people who are very overt about their nuclear power, such as President Trump or President Putin, we should know that they are not out of the ordinary. In every case where we know whether or not a president has contemplated using nuclear weapon and using it first, not in retaliation, but using it first, because the United States has had a first use policy from day one until this very, very night, um, other states have sometimes had a no first use policy. Russia did at a certain point, but doesn't now, uh, and, and China does, and so forth. Every president from whom we have an answer, the answer is yes, they considered it. Um, so for example, President Eisenhower uh, considered dropping an atomic bomb in the Taiwan Straits in 1954, and again considered dropping an atomic bomb in Berlin in 1959. Uh, John Kennedy, according to Robert McNamara, three times came within a hair's breadth of all-out nuclear war. So in the United States, we say, oh, we know about Cuba. Nobody has an idea about three. What were the other two? Um, Lyndon Johnson uh, 
contemplated using a nuclear weapon against China to prevent China from getting a nuclear weapon. Nixon said that he had four times contemplated uh, launching a nuclear weapon. And by contemplated, I don't mean that an idea floated through the mind like just a random sentence. So in the case of Nixon, for example, he uh, sent 18 B-52s loaded with nuclear weapons over around uh, Russia, and it was in part a feint, but it certainly could have been misconstrued um, or led to something very dangerous. Why does the record stop there? It stops there because unlike what you and I do, and unlike what parliaments do, or in the United States case, Congress does, all of which are public and shared, what a president does is secret until the presidential papers 30 years after he's in office come into the presidential library and are there to be, um, and are there to, um, to be read. So I said that the weapon, the arsenal, nuclear architecture, like a simple knife or a certain gun has two ends. And another reason I want to um, mention that is because the tools we have for dismantling nuclear weapons, and we actually do have very serious tools for dismantling nuclear weapons, um, address the two different ends. Um, international law addresses the injuring end. It says that it is illegal to cause suffering of that severity on that scale. You may remember that when the um, International Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons was first being debated, um, it was preceded by a set of conferences in Mexico, Vienna, and other places on the humanitarian consequences of nuclear war that are you know, horrifying accounts of the uh, number of, of people at the center of any city that will be vaporized, the number who will uh, suffer uh, burns over their entire bodies, um, and, and so forth. Um, the firing end of the weapon is, is much less known that we have a redress for that, and that is constitutional law, um, not only in the United States, but in other countries, where um, the Constitution says that you can't begin to injure a foreign population unless and until you have subjected it to many tests. That's what the most basic principle of the uh, social contract as written by Hobbes and Locke um, argued. And, and the argument for it goes back hundreds of years um, long before uh, that uh, even was the case. So the, the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, um, as I think you probably know, was adopted in July of 27 and entered into force in January of 2021. It was signed by 91 countries and was um, ratified by 68 and, and more probably will. And I'm, uh, that is not what I'm gonna be talking about tonight except I'll come back and talk about the um, counterpoint between international law and constitutional law because working together I think it allows uh, for the possibility of uh, the nuclear arsenal to be um, dismantled. So the United States Constitution, and I focus on the United States, A, because I'm a citizen of the United States, so that's my biggest obligation. Two, the United States has, along with Russia, 90% of the arsenal, and three, because it's a, it, it reveals a structure that we'll see exists in other countries as well. Um, it has two breaks on going to war, and the first and most crucial break is the requirement for a congressional declaration of war. Um, and then the second break is the Second Amendment, the right to bear arms, which distributes to the population authority over going to war. Both of these have been trashed in the nuclear age. Um, the requirement for a congressional declaration of war has not been followed in, the, in any time during the atomic uh, age, um, even for conventional wars. The United States had no congressional declaration of war when it went into Korea, uh, into Vietnam, um, into uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, invaded former Yugoslavia, um, et cetera, et cetera, Panama, Haiti, many, many acts of invasion, none of them. The thing that came closest was the first Iraq war when we had a conditional declaration. But in all prior 
declarations, that is prior to the invention of nuclear weapons, the conditional declaration of war was always seen as illegal because it allows parliament to bring, bring about a war without taking responsibility for it. Instead of saying, we hereby declare war, they say, in the event that X happens before Y happens, then Z happens, uh, we will be at war. And no, it's not, and that was what happened in Kuwait. I once asked a legislative assistant um, for the senator in, in my state why they had taken the conditional declaration uh, formulation. And he said because it was the only thing that had a chance of passing. Had it been formulated in the way you're supposed to formulate it, there's not a chance in the world it could have passed. And even as it was, it was an extremely close vote. The, so too the Second Amendment has, has just been st stood on its head and has been wildly misunderstood. Um, the idea that a country could think that the, that the, the notion of the um, right to bear arms is to uh, show one's manhood by going into a school and shooting first graders um, is, shows the kind of horrifying scale of, um, of, of misconstrual. Um, and it is, it is again, uh, something that like the, for the first requirement for a congressional deliberation has just been misun wildly misunderstood. The idea of the right to bear arms was just this. It said, it's, it's actually prior to the question of whether your country is going to have any military force. It says, whether you have zero military force or a great deal, whatever the amount is, it has to be equally divided among every one of us so that each of us controls one small portion of it and exercises uh, control over that. Um, and the, uh, that it was at the time, it was always contrasted to the standing army, which was a military force available to the executive, available to the president, and a militia, which was distributed throughout the um, population. At a later point, I'll come back and talk about that. Nuclear weapons violate both these provisions and these aren't just any two provisions in a constitution. They are the heart of what a constitution is. If you've read Leviathan, you know that on every other page, he says, the whole point of the social contract is getting us out of the miserable condition of war. The whole point of the social contract is getting us out of the miserable condition of war over and over again. He, by the way, like the requirement for a constitution, for a congressional declaration, the requirement for right to bear arms has been uh, really perverted, and, and in fact, philosophy, political philosophy in general, as it's dragged uh, in distorted form into uh, international relations, has has been terribly um, distorted. So, the, uh, the the how does how does it work? Why does the uh, congressional declaration act as a break on going to war? Well, to answer this. I looked at uh, the five cases where the United States had gone to war with the Congressional Declaration, which were the War of 1812, the Mexican-American War of 1846, the Spanish-American War of 1898, and World War I and World War II, um, and compared it with the kind of features that presidential deliberation has. And I looked at the record uh, for the time when Eisenhower considered using a nuclear weapon in the Taiwan Straits and then in the Berlin crisis in um, 59. And it, the, the, the difference is colossal. The congressional deliberation is wholly open to the public. At a time before radio and TV, it was a transcript was made and it was distributed out to the population after the deliberations had taken place, whereas the presidential deliberations are top secret. Um, in one case, you have a clear set of sentences. When Congress is deliberating, there is a set of sentences that said, we hereby declare uh, war against country X. And before the discussion even starts, everyone understands that's what is at issue. There's no clear statement of action in the presidential deliberation, just a kind of diffuse ambient moving around uh, with the word atomic bomb or later nuclear bomb um, showing up. In the case of the Congressional Declaration, there's a conspicuously staged vote. Uh, each person 
comes down to the microphone or, or is called on explicitly? Um, will the representative from uh, Oklahoma, uh, et cetera, and answer is yes or no. Jeanette Rankin, the one person in the uh, House who voted against going to war with Germany and again, or with, against Japan and then later in the declaration against Germany, that's on the record for all time, as are the yes votes. Whereas there's no clear vote, there's no vote at all um, in the presidential case. In the Congress, people are equal and they therefore make arguments with one another. They may even make an argument for a bad reason, such as they want to show off how good they are at making speeches. But even that is a safety device. If I'm motivated to try and think of better arguments than uh, you know, Robert made um, or Felicitas made, um, that inspires me to try and really interrogate whether this country has done something so different from things my own country does that they, their population deserves to be um, gravely injured. Um, in the presidential deliberations, um, a president who, who you know, is simply not the equal, nobody wants to say anything that they think is different than what the president thinks. And if you've read the Cuban uh, missile transcripts, in that case, Kennedy knew that was a problem. So his, his brother, Robert Kennedy, says that he used to purposely say he had to use the restroom to give a chance that someone might say something uh, thoughtful at the table. Um, but again, though any given president might do something like that, nothing in the nature of the deliberation requires it or even inspires it or encourages it. Now, most important, the congressional deliberation is full of dissent. The congressional deliberation is full of dissent, a dismantling of what the word enemy means. Um, wait, we're saying that country's an enemy, but didn't this other country do the same thing? And we're not going to war against that country. Or someone will say, didn't we do it? Or they'll say, yeah, it's a really horrible thing they did, but really, we're going to now start to, et cetera. Nothing in the uh, presidential deliberations um, uh, you know, echoes that, mirrors that. The closest I could find in the Taiwan Straits crisis is one person, Secretary of the Treasury Humphrey, says, aren't we going to have a hard time explaining to the American people why, why islands with names they've never heard of, like Quimoy and Matsu, were so important that uh, we used an atomic bomb? Eisenhower immediately dresses him down. A mere look at the maps on the wall will convince you of the strategic importance of Komoi and Matsu. End of dissent. End of dissent. No one says, you know, I kind of agree with uh, Secretary of Treasury Humphrey. And in fact, in an earlier meeting, Eisenhower had said something very close to that about, you know, people aren't going to know what these islands are that's going to seem odd to them. Uh, and uh, so in some ways, Secretary Humphrey was just, he'd done his homework. Um, he knew that this was, or he thought this would be important to Eisenhower, and it wasn't. By the 59 crisis in Berlin, Eisenhower has decided that, um, that he needs to have one member or two members from Congress present. During the Taiwan discussions, he had repeatedly said, if I use this atomic bomb, I will almost certainly be impeached because it violates 1811, the requirement for a congressional declaration. But I'm willing to do it. I'm willing to do it if I have to do it, even if I'm going to be impeached. By Berlin, he's decided that if he just has a couple of people uh, present, maybe that'll kind of count for getting correct congressional authorization. And of course, that is very far from the truth. The whole point of having a Congress do it is that you have a huge body of people and you have to keep testing it on their pulses. You have to allow them to argue it. And th that would today be 535 people. Um, so one senator, you've probably heard of him, Fulbright, says, I just want to understand what's going on here. Are we saying that the East Germans might uh, destroy the roads in West Berlin and that we might get a repair company in to rebuild them and that a GDR soldier might uh, shoot the repairmen and then we would drop an atomic bomb? Eisenhower says, we're not exactly sure of the steps that would lead to our dropping it. 
But one thing's for sure, once the crisis is underway, he says, we wouldn't have time to consult the UN or anyone else about it. So he doesn't say, Senator Fulbright, really, have you lost your mind? Do you think we would really, in response to rifle fire, drop that? He doesn't say that. He says, we don't know exactly what the scenarios are. I, I think that taking on the right to bear arms, because this is such a, a troubled issue in the United States, a, a, a really tragic uh, issue, um, might, I might not really be able to go into it in too much detail, but I think I can say it this way. If, if you need a conventional army, um, if you need three soldiers, you're going to have to persuade those three soldiers that that other country has done something wrong. And you're also going to have to persuade them that they've so much done something wrong that you're not only going to overcome your own horror of hurting other people, which you've been taught from childhood, you're going to very possibly have to give up your own life. And if you have to have 300 uh, people uh, going to an, an action, then you're going to have to convince 300 people. And uh, when you have a nuclear weapon, you don't have to convince anyone uh, because there's no second break on the thing. You just have to yourself have the idea that this is what is necessary. Now, sometimes people say, um, and actually sometimes when I've, I've lectured in Germany uh, as well, uh, people will say that soldiers just follow orders. Soldiers do not just follow orders. It's just that history doesn't record all the times when soldiers don't uh, follow orders. Now, of course, we know that in Vietnam, there were high numbers of people refusing to go or going and then deserting. Uh, as late as 1971, 33,000 soldiers deserted from the American um, forces. But we think of that as atypical, and it's not at all atypical. So in the recent war in Iraq in 2004, um, 2,000 soldiers deserted. By 2007, twice that many had deserted within the first few months of 2007, and the Department of Defense took it down from their website uh, because uh, it just embarrassed them. The Civil War, the war between the North and South in the United States, um, scholars like uh, James C. Scott, as well as the very great uh, woman historian Ella Lawn from the 1920s, show that the North won because 250,000 soldiers on the southern side deserted. That's why the North won. Um, so we think of soldiers as following directions because they often do follow directions, but that means they consent. And often they dissent. It's just that it's kept out of the record. So at the end of World War I, for example, Churchill writes to Lloyd George, I wanted to take the soldiers um, into Russia to stand with the whites against the Reds, uh, but the soldiers wouldn't let me. Uh, and there were soldier strikes all over um, the England as well as Canada and, um, and India. And th what I'm outlining here, if it, it, the, the one group of people who would never be surprised by any of this are generals, because generals know that unless they have the consent of their soldiers, they have nothing. Um, so Napoleon said, morale factors, are to physical factors by a ratio of four to one. Uh, and uh, Montgomery, one of the generals in uh, Britain, said, in war, morale is not one factor. The soldier's morale is not one factor. It's the only factor. So fast forward to getting rid of the draft in the United States, uh, because what president wants to have to confront what they had to deal with in Vietnam, with everyone protesting on campuses and um, and in Vietnam itself, um, you, don't, you don't need to get anyone's consent. And if they dissent, uh, let them sit in front of their televisions and, uh, and, and dissent. It's for this reason that the right to bear arms has been supported by militarists and pacifists alike. An example of militarists is Mirabeau and the French Revolution, um, who talked about the wealthy uh, having arms and the rest of the people not having arms and the, that, that, that was insufferable. Uh, but so too a pacifist like Gandhi said, um, of all the evil deeds committed by Britain against India, the worst is the disarming of the population. Give us back our arms and then we'll tell you whether we're going to use them. <clears throat> 
or not. Um, one, just one last detail, in the United States, and I, I think this is probably true in other countries as well, the civic start, stature is achieved by bearing military responsibilities. So, for example, the 15th Amendment uh, giving blacks the right to vote in the United States was argued primarily on the basis that 180,000 blacks had fought in the Civil War and therefore couldn't be deprived of um, voting. And uh, the 19th Amendment, which gave women the right to vote, it, what, the, the alliance with the, the capacity for defense isn't quite as stark, but in many suffrage pageants and plays, um, the representation of women's ability to contribute to the defense of the country was made very clear. And then the 26th Amendment, which lowers the voting age from, uh, from uh, 21 to 18, was argued primarily on the basis that, um, that, and now I'm quoting, this generation has earned for itself and all future generations the right to vote at a younger age. That is, it's because of Vietnam, both the soldiers who fought in Vietnam and the people on university campuses who protested it, and those are both explicitly mentioned in the congressional deliberations over and over again, had earned for themselves and later generations the right to vote at a younger age. Now, where does that put us if we're now in a country where the only thing we can do is guess what our leaders are going to do or turn on the nightly news to see if we're once again at war? Um, there have been very few days in the atomic age when the United States has actually um, not been at war. In any event, um, this double location, the fact that you, you have to pass it through the, um, the Congress, and then it essentially has to be ratified by the population, uh, who either will go or will not go, um, makes it a, a, a a very difficult thing to get to go to war. And I think the real analogy for it is constitutional law itself. Um, that is, what differentiates constitutional law from regular statutory law is statutory law just has the authorization of Congress, whereas the, um, the constitutional law um, requires, like if we want to pass an amendment in the United States, it has to go through Congress and then go through state ratifications. Um, and so too, war making should have that very difficult uh, to surmount uh, gate or block on, um, on going to war. Um, now, when, I, when my book on this first came out, one of the um, events was and this took place at Harvard, was a conversation I had with, with two legal scholars, one of whom is a colleague uh, and, and friend, uh, Charles Fried, who's a professor of law at Harvard and was Solicitor General under Reagan. And he was very, uh, very um, crediting of this whole argument, uh, but said, uh, uh, this is poetry, uh, thinking that that might be I think he meant that as a praise. I said, no, it's, I don't mean it as, as poetry. I mean it as something that actually can dismantle by going through the courts um, or going through Congress, we can dismantle it. And then he said, uh, show me the trucks and the trains. So now, a few years later, we do have trucks and trains because we have three bills in Congress. Probably they won't pass. The only way they'll pass is if the American population and populations of other countries speaking to their friends in the United States uh, demand that it be passed. But there are three bills that, on the basis of the constitutional requirement for a declaration, have, have uh, specified the illegality of our presidential sole authority, presidential um, first use. And um, you know, again, there are three bills that uh, are, are uh, alive and well, although they need much more impetus before they will actually pass. We know that sole authority and presidential first use can be accomplished in the current presidency because that legislation, those three different pieces of legislation, are already um, there in Congress. And because President Biden, before he was elected, repeatedly said that he thought he was against presidential uh, first use. And unfortunately, rather than consulting the American citizenry or the citizenry 
of allied countries. He consulted the leadership of NATO uh, countries, all of whom asked him not to uh, declare no first use. Um, and again, I don't think either avenue of repair can happen uh, unless and until uh, large numbers of people um, uh, come forward. So the constitution, uh, constitutional provisions that I've been describing um, also are present in, in other countries. Um, in, French, in France, Article 35 stipulates that um, you have to have par a parliamentary vote uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, to go to war. Um, in India, Article 246 requires that uh, parliament oversee matters of war and peace, um, including whether um, we go to, whether the population goes to war. And the Russian constitution um, similarly states that uh, the president can act up to the borders of the country if the country's invaded or assaulted. It can act, he can act up to the borders of the country, but if he's going to act outside the borders of the country, he has to have the vote of the federal council, which is the equivalent of the um, U.S. Senate. And in fact, the Russian Constitution has a provision very much like the right to bear arms. It says that um, every citizen in Russia has an obligation to participate in the defense of the country. Now. It's not accidental that these countries all have this. It's because that's what a social contract is. Um, again, if you go back to the social contract theory, um, it, the, what, what's always being talked about is the fact that none of us are allowed to injure, only the state can injure, but even the state can't injure unless and until its own population and own Congress have released it from the no injury rule and allowed it to go forward. So it's got a tremendous set of impediments uh, on it that have been uh, thrown away in the nuclear age. Um, and thrown away because you couldn't have, there's no way to make nuclear weapons compatible with social contract or constitutions. The other thing to say is that there's over 42 countries that in their preamble or in an early article in the constitution say that the whole point of the Constitution is to have peace, international and um, domestic peace. And of course, in Germany and Japan, um, there are much stronger um, no war provisions than in most um, constitutions, um, kind of coaxing out the real meaning of what a constitution is. So um, the it, you might think that, that the uh, Elimination of sole authority and first use is, is only one small uh, step. And in some ways, it is just one small step. However, it's much larger than it appears. That is, even though the nuclear arsenal has literally millions of attributes and silos and submarines and moving parts, if you can get a hold of this, um, I believe that you, you actually can bring about the dismantling of the whole architecture. It introduces a spiral fracture into the whole architecture. Um, and I can go into that in more detail at a later moment. Or another way of saying it is that the, the president is the trigger for this nuclear architecture. And if you dismantle the trigger, the weapon is made to uh, be non-functional. Um, so just going back to the fact that we have the counterparts of the international uh, treaty and the constitutional law in the United States and at least three of the other nuclear states, um, what is the relationship between them? Well, again, uh, the, the um, uh, treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons has now been ratified. That, that should say 68 nations uh, have ratified it. And um, the, the problem is that the nuclear states themselves have, not have almost not acknowledged its existence. Uh, and of course, states have or believe they have the right to consent to, to enter into or not enter into uh, treaties. What the United States might say about it if asked, uh, we can learn a little bit about from what they said in the 1995 case at the International Court of Justice where 78 countries asked that nuclear weapons be declared illegal. 
And the litigants in that case included states that did not at that time have nuclear weapons, like North Korea and India, each of whom said if this weren't declared illegal, they would um, have to get it. But you know, all these countries got together. They cited all these protocols about why it, uh, it was illegal, that it violated Geneva Protocols, it violated St. Petersburg, Petersburg, it violated the Convention on the Ozone Layer, it violated on uh, the Convention on Genocide. And in the United States, we had a joint statement by the Department of Defense and the Department of State that said it doesn't violate Geneva, it doesn't violate. Having weapons, using the weapons, using them first, does not violate any of those protocols, not even the Convention on Genocide. They acknowledged that nuclear weapons will kill many millions of people, but they said that the intent would not have been to eliminate a race, and therefore it didn't violate the conventions on uh, genocide. Again, this means it's an uphill battle. Nonetheless, it is a battle that is um, available for all of us to um, participate in. Um, and I just want, want to say that the uh, international law and the constitutional law have um, a set of features that complement one another, different advantages. Um, they arrive out of the same philosophic foundations, but they have very different strengths. International law, law brings pressure to bear on the nine nuclear states from the outside, whereas constitutional law brings pressure to bear from the inside. International law requires each country to be true to every other country. National law requires it to be true to itself. The leaders of nuclear states regard international law as optional, a canopy under which they may or may not choose to stand, depending on whether the law's content mirrors the leader's own wishes. Constitutional law is less forgiving. A leader does not have the option of claiming that his country stands outside its own constitution. Constitutions show mercy toward the, towards the Earth's population by placing coercive restraints on their leader's ability to act in the arena of war. International law has among its advantages the fact that it's overtly ethical. It's worried about the degree of suffering, the horrible scarring, maiming, and just evaporation of human bodies. It speaks about uh, the welfare of all of us. Constitutional law seems more dry, more procedural. Um, it doesn't mention any of those things. It just says what you have to do if you're going to injure. Uh, start injuring a foreign population. And yet, there's centuries of ethical thinking and philosophy embedded in those simple procedural formulations. And uh, they should, in my view, be revered um, and honored uh, and fought for uh, in, the, in the same way. International law has the merit that its vision is total. It calls for the complete elimination of nuclear weapons as well as reparation for those already injured by those weapons, such as the people in the Marshall Islands who have suffered from 67 instances of, of testing, and of course the people in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Constitutional law seems much narrower. It at first seems to only say we're going to dismantle the arrangement for presidential sole authority and first use. And yet, it is uh, the dismantling of the trigger and therefore disabling of the entire Constitution. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that the Kepler Space Observatory has uh, alerted us to the fact that in our own galaxy, there are 50 billion planets, uh, planets circling various stars. And of those 50 billion, 500 million have the conditions for being inhabited by life. Um, and if we go from the Milky Way to other galaxies, the number, of course, hugely increases. This is just a tiny little portion of the sky in the, alex uh, the galaxy cluster Abel. And there are thousands of uh, galaxies there, each of which contains many millions of potentially inhabitable planets. Now, it's these kind of numbers that led the scientist Fermi to formulate what he uh, has come to be known as the Fermi paradox, which is um, why, given that there are so many 
uh, planets that could potentially support life. Um, how can it be that we've not yet heard from anyone else in the universe? And uh, to this question, uh, astrophysicists have given a number of different answers, uh, but one that comes up most frequently is that any species intelligent enough to be capable of um, intergalactic or interstellar communication will also be a species intelligent enough to make a weapon powerful enough to blow itself up and will and has. Um, and I think that this is important because it uh, reminds us that if what we're doing seems hard right now, if it, if it seems very, very hard, um, probably there have been many, many other occasions when living species uh, had this dilemma and couldn't get through it and, uh, and disappeared. And um, where, whereas that might discourage us, um, in my own mind, it actually, um, it actually increases um, my willpower to uh, try and make of ourselves an exception who can actually get this straightened out. I'm just going to take five more minutes to very sketch for you why it's so hard, particularly in the United States, um, to wake people up on this issue. And maybe some of you have other ideas. And I specify the United States because, as I've said to some of you at the center, um, when I have students who really respond to something I say about the nuclear, and they come up to talk to me, the first thing I notice is they have a foreign accent. Um, students from other countries can hear what's being said in a way that um, students in the United States can't hear right now. I'm developing a theory that maybe once they're in the cradle, they're being uh, kind of counseled that whenever they hear the word nuclear, they should leave the room. Um, but uh, um, for whatever reason. So here are just some explanations for the mental architecture that keeps the physical architecture in place. So one is the lack of information. Um, and you ask many people in the United States, um, sometimes so once, more than once I've been on a radio program where they conduct an, uh, a poll and it turns out many Americans uh, are unaware that America ha that the United States has nuclear weapons, or they make a guess of say around 200. But it isn't just it isn't just citizens. Um, recently, I heard one commander of a nuclear submarine in Britain say that the whole time that he was uh, the commander of that Trident submarine, and Britain has four Trident submarines. Um, he assumed that if he got a launch order, it would, of course, be retaliatory for England having gotten wiped out. He said it never crossed his mind that it would be first use. But now he understands that this, the whole time that he was on it, first use was really the only uh, arrangement that was made. And there are reasons for that. Second use, you, you don't have a lot of chance with second uh, use, whereas uh, people feel they have a better chance of harming their opponent with first use. Second is asymmetrical thinking. Recent work in the neurosciences claims that uh, people in power have brain damage. And uh, that, that means literally that their mirror neurons begin to deteriorate. Um, and the, I, I could now recite for you, if time weren't sure, many examples of the United States having become colossally incapable of anything even remotely resembling uh, symmetrical thinking. Um, and a third uh, argument is that there's some justification for it, and the most common one is the idea of deterrence. Earlier, I mentioned General Lee Butler was the head of the Strategic Nuclear Command in all its branches. This is what he said about deterrence. The nuclear priesthood extolled its virtues and bowed to its demands, appropriated from the lexicon of conventional warfare, this simple prescription for adequate military preparation thus became in the nuclear age a formulated for unmitigated catastrophe. It was premised on a litany of unwarranted assumptions, unprovable assertions, and logical contradictions. In other words, it has act some actual meaning in conventional war. It has no meaning in nuclear war and just became a kind of uh, a, a shibboleth that people repeat. Um, the fourth 
uh, explanation is that people believe that what is future is unreal. Um, well, if it happens an hour from now, it doesn't seem very real. And yet, uh, if you think of the nuclear architecture as made up of, let's say, 10,000 steps, 9,999 are in place. They're in place and they're being practiced every day, day and night. Um, there's only one step that isn't real yet that's future, and that's the launch of the weapon. Uh, so it's, it's minutes away. It, it, you know, the launch times are uh, tiny uh, and, whether, and a little bit larger if it's coming from a uh, uh, submarine-launched um, base than, than if it's um, land-based and longer still if it has to be delivered by plane, but, uh, but it's, it's very close indeed. Meanwhile, it's also an invisible architecture these are the, the nuclear missiles on the, on the uh, Ohio-class submarines in the United States or the Tridents in uh, France and England are uh, you know, way larger than the ceiling of this room. They go up three stories. Um, and uh, the, the um, this just made my brain stop thinking to even get too close to <laughs> picturing. Um, picturing them, um, we can't see them. We can't see them. We can't see them on the submarines. We can't see those same missiles buried in the fields of farmers who were, who when they tried to descent, had their land taken away. Uh, that they, they had to have the missiles put there. We can't see them. We can't see them in, when they're at some air force base that is off the public highway. All we see is the civilian. Uh, architecture, and that, by the way, should make visible to us what's going on in the military. So here's just one example. Um, the society, the American Society of Civil Engineers periodically does reports of the American infrastructure. Um, in 2017, they gave us a C plus uh, by their most recent report in, um, in the uh, in 2021, it went down to a C. Uh, they write that each day, 188 million trips take place across a structurally deficient bridge. Um, and uh, I think that, that that number has even uh, slightly increased. That's trips per day over bridges that are um, on sound. So too, our, they give our roadways um, a D and attribute many of the accidents that are happening to um, the, the quality of the, the potholed roadways. They give our transit, I'm sure you've heard Americans gasp when they experience German uh, public transit or Swiss transit or uh, J Japanese transit uh, because it's so much better than in the United States. Um, a very large percentage, I think it's 14% of our, our public vehicles, they declare uh, to be deficient, dangerous, deficient to the point of danger, and 6% um, of all the rails uh, in, in like the railroad tracks are um, in, in dangerous condition. So to the levees, there are uh, some huge number, I think it's 30,000 um, miles of levees in the United States and um, they have uh, behind them huge populations, including many different many uh, schools. And um, let me just make sure. Yeah, 30,000 miles of levees with 4,500 schools who serve 2 million students are right behind these levees. And the levees uh, they are giving the grade of D to. So this is the photographic negative of the invisible underground nuclear architecture. Um, the, it's been estimated, the Congress is obligated to report the amount we're spending on uh, nuclear weapons, and the, and the cost uh, is actually $70,000 a minute, every minute. Um, so it's, it's, that's why this is happening. Eventually, uh, we, we will no doubt be helping to rebuild Ukraine. Uh, you will probably be helping to rebuild Ukraine too, and should, since we've um, encouraged them on and to keep holding on. And you have to wonder how we're going to do it since our own infrastructure 
is very much falling apart. Another reason is the difficulty of imagining other people's pain, um, but we don't make any attempt in the realm of nuclear weapons. Um, we have in Heidelberg a church that has the date of um, Hiroshima on its, its window. Um, and uh, when you go to Japan, this is the Nagasaki Museum, you can go there anytime and you will see tiny school children coming in and looking at the displays. And what they have to look at is hard to look at indeed. Um, this is the kind of injury that uh, the children are looking at. In the United States, um, most Americans, you know, August uh, 6th and, and August 9th pass um, with almost no awareness that those are anniversaries of, um, of those uh, acts. And um, what finally, or, or next to finally, there's the problem that many people in the United States believe that once nuclear weapons are made, they can't be unmade, which is uh, ridiculous. Um, this is a study that was done by a British author, John Ainslie, of the timetable that it would take to dismantle the nuclear weapons in Britain. And again, Britain, of course, has a much smaller arsenal than the United States does. Nonetheless, it indicates uh, the timeline. And our own military has said that this is, this is accurate. Um, the triggers can be dismantled in a matter of hours. Then it takes a bit longer to bring the submarines into port uh, and then to, to uh, get all the nuclear, dangerous nuclear um, materials away. Uh, takes even longer, but the whole thing can be done in two to four years. Hope that uh, our confirmation that a nuclear free world is possible comes to us all the time from the southern hemisphere that's literally blanketed with uh, nuclear weapons free zones. The Treaty of Tataloka, the Treaty of Perlandaba, the Treaty of Bangkok, the Treaty of Rantoga, et cetera. And in fact, for any of you who care about the cruelty of the northern hemisphere in regard to the southern hemisphere, um, evidence number one is this, which is from Wiki, which is the map of the nuclear states in red, which are all in the northern hemisphere, and the map of the nuclear weapons free zones, which are all in the um, southern hemisphere. And finally, what makes it hard is the circularity of it. Because um, nuclear weapons are literally incompatible with constitutional provisions and social contracts, because they're mutually exclusive, you have to choose one. Um, the United States and the other nuclear countries have chosen nuclear weapons, which means that the most important provisions of their social contract are no longer functional, and therefore they look like uh, dead pieces of, of paper. Um, Thomas Paine, in his Rights of Man, said uh, at the time that, that the American and French uh, constitutions would change the world. And then he said, the American constitution practically creates the parts of speech. Um, it's the w it has the same relation uh, that, that syntax has to language. So if you've just destroyed the syntax and the parts of speech, um, there is nothing but kind of cognitive anarchy that can result. But it also means that when we say that these are the tools we could use, that people say, well, that's not a very interesting tool. Um, and uh, we have to recover the sense, I think, of uh, what great tools they are. So thank you very much.